But as we delve into <clears throat> where I feel like God is heading us this morning, we're going to be in Luke, tail in the six, good part of seven. Humorous last night, um, we had a birthday celebration for Donna with the family, and nephews were there, four and two, and my birthday's coming up, you heads up. <laughs> <laughs> and we were talking about that, and he said, um, so your birthday's coming up. Yeah. He was asking how old you'll be. And then he asked the question, you going to heaven? <laughs> yeah. He said, soon? <laughs> <laughs> Reminded me of a joke that a Sunday school teacher told me one time that had been talking about coming to know Jesus and accepting him and accepting his will for your life and and recognizing what that meant in salvation, and they had been going through a lot of stuff. So she finally presented to her, her classroom the statement, you know, what does it take to get to heaven? Silence. Come on, class. We've been, we've been studying it. We've been going through the things. We've been talking about the scriptures. Anybody remember? What does it take to go to heaven? Still nothing. Silence. And finally, uh, one of the five-year-olds that was in the class said, well, you got to be dead. <laughs> so his understanding of that, and then I, I remember a, a thought of, you know, and as we're going into this, this study and, you know, we're thinking about this transition, there was a whole grade side service that was going on. And right at the end of it, the, the end of the, the service, the, all of a sudden a tremendous thunder, and a great lightning bolt, and all echoing thunder in the background and everything else, and as the uh, thunder continued to roll, the little old man looked up at the preacher very calmly and said, well, she's there. <laughs> <laughs> so as we go into our scripture, we want to we're going to start out with chapter 7, and, and, and it's the faith of the centurion, but that's not, we've, we've covered that before, and that's not really the message of the day, but it does really lead up to, to what goes on beyond that, and, and, and the understanding that we want to get from, from the next little snippet of, of information is, is that there's, there's a deep sorrow, you know, I uh, <clears throat> cut in, out of a book that, I, that I've read that talks about childhood children and children's death. And it, it speaks, it says, all, of all deaths, that of a child is most unnatural and it's the hardest to bear. In Carl Jung's words, it is a period placed before the end of a sentence. Sometimes when the sentence has hardly begun. When we expect, well, we, we expect the old to die, the separation is, is, is always difficult, but it comes as no surprise. With the child, the youth, life lies ahead with its beauty, its wonder, its potential. Death is a cruel thief when it strikes down the young. The suffering that usually precedes death is another reason childhood death is so hard for parents to bear. Children were made for fun and laughter. For sunshine, not for pain. They have a child's heightened consciousness rather than the ability to cope with suffering <clears throat> that comes from maturity. They also lack the, the kind of amnesia of senality in a way that is different from other human relationships. A child is bone of the parent's bone, flesh of their flesh. When a child dies, Part of the parents is buried. I met a man who was in his 70s during our first 10 minutes together. He brought a faded photograph of a child out of his wallet. The 
child who had died almost 50 years before. You know, for those who have children, it's the unspeakable, amen? It's the, it's the unimaginable. Maybe there's some who've experienced that, who have, who have participated in, in, that, in that sorrowful thing. That there's, there's a lot of us who have maybe laid ourselves before that possibility. Does that make sense? That, that, that we've actually come to the place where, where we really try to put that into concept, if, if that was a reality, if that happened, based upon <clears throat> circumstances, how would I react? How would I be? How would I move on? Huh? Those types of questions. But what we see in the beauty of this story is following the faith of the centurion, we see, we see a woman who is facing this very thing. And we see a lot of analogies within it that we want to get out today. We want, we want to extract from the Word of God today to apply in our lives. As we look at suffering, as we look at circumstance, as we look at issues in our life, because I believe that Jesus was showing in this His power over the most worthy of foes, so to speak. And being that his power is, is over the most worthy of foes than, than anything beyond, anything lower than that, anything that comes behind, then he's got power over that too. And too often it is, as we fast forward to the point of maybe losing a loved one or, or our own lives, and we say, you know what, I, I, I've got my security in, in Christ and, and, I, and I've got that nailed down. And then we live our daily, our daily life in and out of that reality. In and out of, is God on the throne? In and out of, does He have control over these things? In and out of, does He really want to work in my life every day? And I believe that He showed His supreme authority, His supreme ability, so that we could accept everything from the supreme to what we consider very benign, very small. And He's over all of those things. Amen? Mm -hmm. But too often we don't live our lives. We live our lives sometimes when we get into this churchy thing and we have this the church role and, and, and we know that we're, we're born again believers and we get, to, we get the punctuation, right? We get the end of the day. And we've accepted that and we're good with that. But, it, but it's the day-to-day -day life that seems to somehow cripple us. Anybody? So when we go in, we, we want to briefly go through this, this, this uh, story of the faith of the centurion to get to the place where we're at. So it says, starting in, in chapter 7, verse 1, When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come heal his servant. And when they had come to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this. Well, we'll stop there for a, a, a caveat second. This man deserves to have you do this. You see, even the religious leaders of those de that day who didn't believe in Jesus and didn't believe in Jesus' power were coming to Jesus and saying, hey, we know you got the ability to do it, and this man deserves it. And they, <clears throat> you know, you see, that they had accepted what? They accepted the role somehow that Jesus had the power to do, and he was over those certain things. They just hadn't rationalized in their minds that if he had the power to do this, then he must be who he says he is. You see, we compartmentalize, we separate, the, we separate those things and we do those things in our lives too. We say, well, at the end of the day, I'm going to be saved. At the end of the day, I'm going to go to heaven. At the end of the day, I'm going to be a child of a God. When he says, today, you are a child of God. Today, today, if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you receive those things all the way up to the superiority of His rule, to the very, very, very minimal things that we think in life. The thing that's beautiful about Christ is He doesn't do things like we do. He didn't go through and say, well, I've died on the cross. Up to you now. Right? I've done all I could do. 
Because if that was the end result, if that was how God was really going to respond to us in creating us, then truly creation itself was enough. Right? The sun coming up, the sun going down, the grass growing, the crops coming, the, the, the fact that we have food to eat and air to breathe, that, that should be enough. Because if one of those elements that he commanded into being stopped happening, like we said before, it would go to the top on our hierarchy list, right? <clears throat> but we might say shelter, food, but it, as we break it down in, a, in America, it's internet service. <clears throat> phone phone bars. <laughs> Find it in the top five. Tell some of you would check your phone before this is over. I'm watching. <laughs> because it's the truth. But in the hierarchy of needs, if the sun did not come up tomorrow, what would go to one? Please come up, sun. If the season didn't change and it stayed summer. Now, in the middle of winter, we say, I wish it would stay summer. <laughs> Amen? In the middle of summer, we say, we wish it was winter. And God says, done. But if any of those things changed, it would, it would radically change the way we live our lives, what we do, how we construct those things. So, so, so in the truth, if he was just going to say, this and this alone, and that's good enough, he could have stopped with creation. He didn't have to send Jesus Christ to die on the throne, to die on the cross, to now sit on the throne on our behalf. To, to lift up intercessory prayer for us on a continuum. You see, we're trying to understand prayer without ceasing. Jesus has got it down pat. He prays without ceasing. And He's fond of each and every one of you. From the littlest thing to the eternal. From the smallest thing to the greatest. Not because you deserve it. That's where they had it wrong. This man deserves this. Because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. You see, they put the, the understanding. Why, why does he deserve it? Because he's, he's, he supports our religion and, and he tithes. <laughs> he built the building. So he deserves this. Jesus didn't argue it. That's the beauty of Jesus is he didn't spend any time wasting words, mincing words. This was the creative, creative, creatable, even if that's a word, I don't know if it's not, I just created it. Creatable voice of God, Jesus Christ, didn't waste words. So he didn't spend time arguing with them that he didn't deserve or did. He just went on along with them, not because he deserved. He was not far from the house when the centurion friends said to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve. You see, he sent the word back out because he had an understanding that this gift, this thing that you can impart, this power that you have, it's not because I deserve anything. It's not because I've done anything to earn. Not because I build a synagogue. Not because I believe in the nation of Israel. Not because in, that, in any of those dynamics whatsoever. I don't deserve what you have. He had a recognition of that. He said, and that is why I don't even consider myself worthy to come to you. I haven't come to you on my own because I don't feel myself worthy to be. But I, but I do know. But say the word. But say the word. And my servant could possibly be healed. That's not what he says, right? He says, you say the word, and I know that my servant will be healed. And my abstract understanding of that is, is, is what I'm going to give you, is what, is what he continues on to say. He's like, because for I, I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes. And I tell that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. He says, I understand that things are under your authority. Is what he's truly saying there, amen? Because I recognize authority in my own life. I recognize that there's a place in my life where I can say to certain things, do, and they do. But I recognize in your life, Jesus, that you can say certain things like, let there be light, and there's sunshine. <laughs> right? I recognize that there are things under your authority that all you have to do is speak to them. And it will 
happen. You see, the only difference was, is, is these soldiers, you know, they could be told to do something, but they understood in that day much more than we do. You know, you, did, you didn't um, go AWOL in that day. You might get put on a wall. <laughs> you got me? But you didn't go AWOL. They understood what their obedience e equal to. Their disobedience, death. Be taken away, taken out, removed. Their obedience meant they continued to serve, continued to hold that position. But in the same essence, we know how we are, right? If I was one of those soldiers, servants, I might do what he said. But when he ain't looking, I go back to doing what I wanted to do, right? The difference is, is, is the elements that Jesus has, has control over, the authority over. The people who truly have Jesus in their heart don't go back to doing what they want to do because he's not looking. Because they recognize he is always looking. Amen. And when he fills the person, he fills them to overflowing for someone else's benefit, not for their own. So if we're still in a place of hiding where we, where we think there's some of this, this little pet sin that we can you know, take into the throne room of God, no, loved ones. If you've still got that pet sin, all it's doing is distracting you from the throne room of God. Because it certainly can't enter it too distractive. We've used these, you know, it's no different than, than having a baby that doesn't understand the circumstance, that doesn't understand the magnitude of what's going on, and maybe maybe at the inappropriate time they say something like, um, you going to heaven soon? <laughs> Sweet and beautiful. One of y'all said that about me, I might be, that might be an offense. <laughs> Well, she'd wrap it up soon. <laughs> but within that dynamic, we understand that there's certain things that don't play play out in in, in, a, in a in a place of reverence and a place. So if we think that we're we're sitting here, what it is is, is what happens is I kind of have this thing in my mind that that we go through and, and we're trying to communicate with God and we're we're doing everything that we can to communicate with God, but but our pet sin just needs so much attention. So much distraction. God, I would really like to know what... It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. God cannot... Because it has no place there. We can't take our pet sin into the throne room of God. Please, grasp that. And what he's saying is, is, is the reality of God and the reality of Christ being the creative Word of God is that He has authority over all. And that's not part of the time. Now, now if you feel like it's part of the time, that's by your own volition. And guess who granted you that volition? The same guy who's in control of everything. He's the one who gave you the ability to have the will. Gave you the right to make a choice. Gave you the, the right to, to work within and without. But don't turn around and say, why God, if you decided to work without? Right? Isn't that the analogy that we see here? You know, I've seen it a bunch of times, especially like when 9-11 happened. And, and I certainly hear it in counseling. If, if God is good, then... Why this? If God is good, then why is there... If God's created everything, then why is there immorality? If He created everything, He must have created that. You hear all those questions, and they come from the wrong understanding, because the, the first thing that they put in question is, if God. Love when God is, not if God. And what happens within that 9-11 that scenario is that we say, well, you know, if, the, if God's on the throne and He's a loving God, how could He allow that circumstance to happen? And you've probably heard me give this analogy before, but it's, it, it applies to where we're going today. And the counsel that God gave me in that circumstance is no different than us saying, you know, here in Monticello, <clears throat> the crime rate is gone way, way down. 
I'm not saying it's a fact. I'm not going to say you can go on a trip with me. But it's gone way, way down. And when I look at the budget, there's so much expenses, there's so much time spent with the police department. You know, with the crime rate being what it is, why, oh why, do we need to spend all this time, energy, and finances on the police department? Let's just do away with it. And then the next day you get robbed and you start screaming, where is the police? You know, when we take God out of our schools, when we take the Ten Commandments out, when we take those truths out, when we take prayer out, when we start trying to remove God from our American society and we allow that to happen as a church by being silent about it, because it is the very, very minute minority that is being successful in that endeavor, loved ones. Amen. Very, very small percentage. And it's because the monolith that is the body of Christ is silent. And what happens when he's removed, he's removed, he's removed, and something like that happens, and then we want to scream, where's the police? Where's the protection? Where's the protector? Now in our own lives, we, we go through the same navigation. We, we navigate from, from saying, well, in eternity I will, I will have this understanding. In eternity, I will accept this truth. And in eternity, it's all secure for me. But currently, currently, I've got to live this life. And I just got to do what I got to do. And that's just me. You got to understand, when, when somebody backs me in the corner, I, that's just me. That's the problem, is it is still you. It's not Him. It's got to be Him. Transformed. And when you're backed in the corner, allow Him to respond. Be obedient to Him. Then you can get the blessing. You can't let you act, let you do, let you throw the fist, and then say, where was God? God was right there saying, if you, if you give that to me, I can fix it. If you'll turn that over to me, I've already got a plan. Not a dream. I've got a plan. You see, God, all, all, all God's deals are plans. Because He has the resources and the time of which to make it happen. That's the difference between a dream and a plan, isn't it? We all have a dream for our children. We don't all have the time and resources to allow that dream to happen for them. God's got the time and the resources to make it all happen for each one of us. He has a plan, not a dream. <clears throat> when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Because he had a very quick understanding of what? That Christ is over all. And if he says it, it will happen. He didn't have deep theological understanding. He didn't tie in a bunch of Old Testament scriptures that he had heard. He didn't go through all these other, the other rhetoric or the explaining away of the priesthood or the not. All he did is say, you know what? I recognize this guy has got power over everything. And what he says happens. Loved ones, it's still true today. What he says happens. It doesn't matter what your circumstance is. You see, and then he moves along. Then the men who had been sent to return to the house found the servant healed well. Why? Who said so? And there was an understanding of what he said. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to the town called Nain. Well, it's soon afterwards, you know, it's not immediate, it's about 25 miles away, so it's probably a day's journey. But pretty much, you know, we, we understand that at this point, there were certainly, you know, and sometimes we miss that in the scriptures, we don't try to get the picture of what's going on. You see, it wasn't that shortly afterwards, 
Jesus departed, and he's solely walking by himself down the street ahead of the name, silently doing nothing, kicking rocks, just walking down the road. We know that at this point there were tens of thousands of people that were walking behind you, a crowd. They wanted to see things. They wanted to experience things. They, 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 they were amazed at the stuff that was going on. So it wasn't like there was just this silent solitude of, of an experience where Jesus shortly after just kind of departed from and it was just Jesus walking up on this, this, this funeral. <coughs> we got that picture? There's a huge crowd. And we have, we have two crowds that meet in this circumstance. Loved ones, this is true today. There's two crowds. <laughs> There's two crowds. One crowd heading into the city celebratory. One crowd is headed to the funeral. That's real today. There's only two classes of people. Those who are headed to the city with Jesus and those who are headed to a funeral. Because guess what? They're already dead. <laughs> they weren't preparing for the funeral. They weren't saying this kid could possibly pass away. The kid was dead. Being carried by. And if we do any study of that day, we know that, that there were professional mourners We've talked about those before, right? Oh! Fours. And they have to look down at their notes to find out which, which, what, what the name of the kid was. Because it was just their professional thing. And, and what we know about in that day is also when a funeral procession was coming, that it was very respectable. And we still have some of that respect today. Some of us, some of us, when a funeral procession comes by, we'll pull over. Some of us are still too busy. We try to race ahead or get around. But there's still some kind of respect. There's still come some kind of understanding. All the, all the, we turn all our headlights on. We have flags. We have something to, to identify that we are a group of people that are headed to do something. And there's a respect for that. No different, though, though much more core to the understanding of the families in this day. because. Quite honestly, the families in this day, as a funeral would walk by and the professional mourners, you know, the, 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 the mother, the, the bride, the, the widow, the whatever would be up front, right up front. The Spirit, it's the same today. So that's, that's who Jesus would have come in contact with first, is her, right up front. But all the mourners that were behind and the pallbearers or whatever, however you want to call them, would be carrying. And then there would be people that, that as they walked through, they wouldn't just pull over. They would join. They would join. Especially to the magnitude of recognizing a widowed woman and her only son. They would have had some sincere concern because they would have reflected on themselves and said, man, her situation was bleak to begin with. Now, now it's impossible. Now the sorrow that she faced, she's already lost her husband and maybe other children. <clears throat> But the only one that she has, the, the one and only, and their sorrows were magnified as, as the people joined into this procession. So we see that two crowds meet. We also see that two only sons meet. Jesus Christ and her dead son. Two only sons meet. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with them. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. The large crowd from the town was with her. Loved ones, are we getting the picture of the analogy now? Mm -hmm. The large crowd of Jesus celebratory entering and the large crowd of the dead person 
come in contact with one another. And the reality is, is that clash is always going to happen because Jesus is never going to allow someone to go to death without face-to-face -face interaction. Those clashes are always going to happen. The one and only Son of God, the one and only Son of this woman, have now come face-to-face. -face. When the Lord saw her, His heart went out to her. You know, sometimes I, I try to look at that situation and say, you know, quite honestly, was, was Jesus even, even making that connection, being who He was and, and fully divine and fully, fully human, that He was looking at that situation and along the roads He was seeing, the, as we study on Wednesday nights, the architecture of God how we can see it throughout the Old Testament, how He does things and how He brings things to be and the methodology that He uses. And, and as Jesus is walking along and He sees this woman that's weeping and crying and her only son sitting up there, that He's making that connection, this is, this is the reality. This is the salvation experience. The one and only Son. The one and only Son. The one and only Son. Refreshing God. Refreshing me because along the way I can see your hand, I can see your plan, I can see what you're doing and where I'm headed. Thank you for that refresher, God. And I just weep for her. And, and the, boy, the boy can't die. Because, because if the boy is to be representation of somehow comparatively Jesus, the only son, right? He can't die because only one could die. Only one, not Isaac. Only one could truly die. Some could point to. Some could have the architecture of. But only one could truly die. Because only one's death truly meant anything. <coughs> so Jesus weeps with her. And He says to her, don't cry. And haven't we said that before? In counseling someone who's bereaved, we, we say don't cry, but truly, truly in, in our sense and in our understanding, <laughs> what, what, what is the end result of what we're saying is it's really not going to do any good. The end result of put some dirt on it. It's not really going to do any good to sit here and to weep and to mourn and to do. That's truly at the core of why we offer that up. The beauty of when Jesus was saying, don't cry, because he knew what he was fixing to do. He wasn't going to, and please get this, he wasn't going to comfort her in her bereavement. He was fixing to remove the reason for her bereavement. Loved ones, for anyone who has recognized the darkness of their soul, their need for a redeemer, oh, they should be able to relate. Blessed are those who mourn. Because in recognizing that there is nothing that connects me to God aside from Jesus, there is nothing in and of myself that does that. It's only Jesus. Then I am blessed. I mourn because I recognize the depravity of my soul and the separation that that is. And Jesus says, don't cry. Don't cry. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not only going to comfort you in your bereavement. I am going to remove the reason for your bereavement. For eternity. Then he went up and touched the beer. What? He just had a beer. Wake up. <laughs> beer is a coffin. Just an open coffin. They were carrying him on and the bears stood still. 
loved ones, if this isn't your experience, if when Christ came to you and said, don't cry, if time did not stand still, oh, I pray, I pray that you allow that to be a reality for you this morning. Because when Christ comes down on the scene and he starts to move, Everything freezes. Everything stands still. Why? Because everything is under his authority. He didn't say, stand still. He simply put his hand on. standing still because the God of the universe, the creative word of God, was about to do something. If that hasn't been your salvation experience, loved ones, I think you've sold yourself short. And if you haven't experienced that along the way with your suffering or the trials and tribulations you might face or the difficult decisions that you have to make, the things that are put before you because God has a bigger plan then our pettiness, if he hasn't frozen things for you every once in a while, maybe you're not close enough for his touch. He's calling. He's calling out. He's saying don't cry, but are you close enough for his touch? You see what, what was happening right here? We have two crowds, right? Two only sons. Two sufferers. Because Christ was going to suffer. But then we had two mortal enemies. The two mortal enemies were coming face to face. When he touched that coffin, and the men who were carrying that coffin froze, loved one's life, and death stared each other face to face. The two immortal enemies that there are, and there's only two, loved ones. This world will keep us so busy thinking that there's just plethora of choices, these plethora of options, these plethora of circumstances. The reality is, in eternity, it's going to be very visibly understandable that there is really only two. Like it or not, that's the truth. And the Word of God says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone will recognize that there's only two choices. And that's what was being recognized here is Jesus' supreme power over the biggest foe that we put out there is death. That's the biggest foe. And it says, from here on, I'm going to, since they're going up there, well, he put, yeah, I'll help me. He put on boxing gloves. He trained. He got ready for the fight. He, he begged, please, please, death. Please, death, come out of the boy. No death, death, don't take the boy. I better go back up here, right? <laughs> Young man, I say to you, get up! There what loved ones, there wasn't no mud put on the eyes. There wasn't no go and bathe. There wasn't, when it comes to death, it's that way. He says, get up. You see? And somehow we, we disconnect ourselves from this story somewhat because somehow this kid was dead, but he still... Because Christ has power over death, over the physical, over the supernatural. His voice will ring like a trumpet 
And he's coming back. He's coming back. That same voice is going to resound. First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. Just make a note of it because it applies right here. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of the archangel with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive or are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. That trumpeting voice, get up! It's coming. It's coming. The question is, have you heard it now? Because you don't want to wait and hear it then. Because those Thessalonians and what we just read doesn't explain the ones who didn't hear it up until that point in time is not a pretty picture. Christ's voice is speaking into your situation this morning. And though you might not be dead, laying on a stretcher, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are dead in your transgressions. And that is a spiritual, eternal death that's much more consuming than a physical and I can tell you though you might not feel like he's calling out to you this morning because you're not lying on a stretcher his voice is calling out to your circumstance you might say I know that Clay I felt that and he's froze the light for me and I remember that day and I can remember him moving into my life and I can can experience those things. Well, what He's speaking into you today, because loved ones, this message isn't just for the unbeliever, it's for the believer. What He's speaking into you today is through your physical ailments, through your circumstances, through whatever it is that's pinning you down. Get up! Amen. Healing is available if you will use that healing for the kingdom of God. Period. Exclamation point. Better than period. <clears throat> the dead man sat up and began to talk. You see the action? You can't be silent about that, amen? You can't be silent about being brought from death back to life. The problem is, is we don't recognize the depravity of ourselves sometimes. Sometimes even, even after the experience we've forgotten the depravity of where we came from, from death to life. From death to life. What do you think the words were that were coming out of this kid's mouth? receives its first new breath. Oh, I think he sang in a different voice. I think the words that he had to say prior, he might have been all the way up into that death, you know, how we do. Oh, oh, I'm just not feeling so good. And for the past six months, eight months, we don't know how long he was sick. We don't know why he died. We don't know what the circumstances. We just know he was dead. And we know what we do in, in that bereaving process. Oh, <coughs> He might have spent a year, he might have spent six months, he might have spent five years on his deathbed getting to the place where he truly died and all he could talk about was his imminent death, that it was headed to death, and that I'm going there and that I feel horrible and that I do this and I do this. But when Jesus brought him back to life, all of that, all of that had no weight. Death had lost its sting. When Christ come face to face with death, lost its sting. 
So the boy didn't get up saying, oh, well, my liver, or oh, well, my... He got up saying, no, no, no. There's some of us that need to do that for the first time today. And there's those of us that, that need to step up and hear the voice of Christ saying, get up. Get up. Not, not for our eternal salvation because we got that. No, he's saying get up and stop allowing your current circumstance to dictate what your eternity is going to look like. What you believe your eternity is going to look like. Jesus is saying get up. circumstance that happened back in 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 19 through 24 Elijah says give me your son he took him from her arms and he carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed and cried out to the Lord O oh Lord my God have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die. And then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry. You see, it's a similar story. But Elijah couldn't stare death face to face. Elijah had to go through a process of calling on and bringing forth. The one he was calling on and trying to bring forth was the one who touched the coffin and froze town. All he had to say was get up. That's who we have today. But yet we're still lying around waiting for the third time for Elijah to lay on top of us. Amen? We're still sitting around waiting for something else to happen, waiting for God to do this, waiting for God to do that. Loved ones, God already has done the biggest thing that will ever be done in all of eternity, and that is coming in a fleshly body and dying on a cross so that you could have fellowship with Him. There is nothing bigger, nothing greater, nothing more miraculous than that. And He's saying to us who know that to get up and start talking. Get up. And stop allowing your current circumstance to change your talk. What is it that you're talking about? Are you talking about the old death? The old dead body? The old circumstances? Or are you talking about the new? Because His mercies are every morning. Is that what we're talking about? It'll change your life if you will. Even the believer. Even the believer. Non-believer, it'll change your life for eternity. <laughs> believer, it'll change your life in the here and now until we get to eternity. Amen? Amen. Amen. The message is the same. Get up. Uh, the Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. <laughs> Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house and he gave him to his mother. Same dynamic. Jesus gave her son back to the mother. Look! Your son is alive! What's the purpose? What was the purpose? Then the woman said, Elijah, now I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the How will they know? How will a culture that doesn't know Jesus come to know Him as the truth? When we get up and start talking and living our life victoriously and living our life in a way that makes it desirable. 
for the unbeliever. Instead of the old Eeyore Christianity, right? Oh, don't worry about me. Nobody else does. I'm just saved. Saved by grace. I once was a and a and a and a and everybody that you talk to saying, yep, <laughs> yep, yep, and ain't seen much of a change. Instead of going from my once was a, I am a, I am a child of God. I've been restored to life. He has said, get up, and I obey. It didn't say he said, get up, and then Jesus lifted him up. From the dead, from the dead he heard the cry. He said, get up. And the boy replied in obedience. Same dynamic is the, is the outstretched arm, right? The healing came from action. The healing came from obedience. But too often we're laying around like the Elijah story. Laid on us once. Nothing. Laid on us twice. Nothing. Laid on us a third time. God put the branding iron to a rear end. And it finally popped up. The difference is, is we have Jesus. Jesus don't have to lay on anything. He just freezes it. And if it's never been frozen for you, love one.